<laughs> you use the old uh, principal big voice of the past, but <clears throat> all right. Hey, it's good to see all of you here today. Especially good to see some of you visiting. We have Mindy's sister visiting today. We have Mrs. Potter, who was sitting here a minute ago, who was visiting and take care of the boys while Dan and Julie are away on an anniversary trip. And so that's all good. We are continuing, and it's good to have Bill and Belinda back after their long trip. How many miles did you end up traveling all together? <laughs> uh, that's just, that's amazing to me. You know, I consider a long trip something over 200 miles. I'm tired, you know, so. <laughs> well, the part is we were both jammed in the cab of that truck, and we both made it back alive. <laughs> but do you still like each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, get, we still get along and everything. Oh, that's <laughs> miracles. All right, that's great. <laughs> Good to have you back. Thank All right. You. Well, we are continuing our study in Samuel, and um, we're going to be dealing with this topic of Eli and Samuel and his sons this week and next week, and I'll be doing uh, these two lessons. Anything you would especially like for me to remember in prayer before we begin today? Yes, Barbara. My friend is. Yes. Okay. Okay, absolutely. All right. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for the health, the strength, the ability to be here today, to come together as your children, to look at your word that you preserve preserved for us. And we thank you for this rich history of how you've worked in the lives of these people. We pray, Lord, that we would learn from their experiences, their walk with you. We pray we'd even learn from those who are provided as negative examples to us, that we would avoid those mistakes, and that we would consistently seek to draw near to you and allow you to work in our lives. Help us to be submissive to your will. Lord, I do pray for Barbara's friend Dennis as he's dealing with this health situation, his cancer. We ask that you would be close to him, that you would draw him close to yourself. We pray for Morgan, and we pray for others that we could mention here, uh, who are children who have not accepted the truth that they've seen taught in homes or demonstrated by their parents. And we pray that even yet you would work in their lives, that you would help them understand the importance of recognizing who Jesus is and submitting their lives to him. We ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes this morning, open our ears, give us a desire to apply these truths that we're looking at in the book of 1 Samuel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Well, 1 Samuel is a book that records the life of Samuel, Israel's last judge. You may remember from some of our introductory material that it wasn't always called 1 and 2 Samuel. It was just called Samuel. And for a time, it was actually called 1 Kingdom and 2 Kingdom. And so, but it is dealing with, with Samuel as a really key figure. So it is named after him. Not written by him, although he may have recorded some of it. The Lord used various people to record this history for us accurately. There's a number of characters that enter the picture throughout the book, but it primarily focuses on the interactions of two characters at a time. That's an interesting thing. So in these first seven chapters, we see Eli and Samuel, who are kind of the focus of these first seven chapters. Then in chapters 8 through 15, we see the emphasis, the focus going on Samuel and Saul, and then the rest of the book, from 16 to 31, Saul and David. So just kind of keep that in mind, that these are the focuses. Again, there's other characters in this play, but uh, that's where the, the main focus is. And so in this first part, we're continuing to look at uh, Eli and Samuel and how the Lord is working in both of their lives. There's a number of important themes in the book, too. You probably recognize this slide from when we looked at a Bible project overview um, for uh, First and Second Samuel, and this shows um, 
a slide looking at Hannah's song, her song of praise. And um, this psalm, the song is very important because it introduces a number of important themes that are in the book. And you can see those indicated right here. God opposes the proud and exalts the humble. That's something that we're going to actively see in this week's lesson and next week and other places throughout the book. Um, the second mention here is this, despite human evil, God is at work. We're going to see that as well. And God will raise up a messianic king. Now, this, this prayer of praise with these elements in it are basically functioning as what we would call foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is a narrative device in which a storyteller gives an advance hint of what is to come later in the story. And so these themes mentioned here are advance hints. You're going to see several times throughout the book God opposing the proud and exalting the humble. And you're going to see several times, despite human evil, God is at work. And of course we do have this wonderful theme here about God will raise up a messianic king, and there will be more on that that will be, be shown as well. So the foreshadowing um, naturally appears at the beginning of the story, foreshadowing, and it helps um, develop uh, our expectations about upcoming events. So kind of keep that in mind. Well, because the content of her prayer is connected to events that will appear in this lesson, we're going to take a very quick, brief look at it again. First, we need to remember the setting for this prayer. What had just happened when she prayed this prayer? And perhaps recorded this prayer. It was recorded by somebody. What had just happened? Well, it wasn't just his birth. No? Yes, that's it. She was taking him to the, and leaving him in the temple. Right, exactly. And so finally, after he had uh, been weaned, they were taking him to the temple. And we said that he could have been, you know, anywhere from three, four, five years old. Very young. And it's really kind of hard for me to imagine. Uh, Karen and I had four kids, and we're grateful for each one of them, and I enjoyed them as a father. I have to be honest with you, those were really busy years. They were busy years for me as far as my career. I was teaching, I was a principal, I was meeting myself going and coming, and at times I was only vaguely aware of some little people around the house, okay? And, um, you know, you know, again, I'm not trying to say I, I ignored them, but really, I give huge credit to Karen for giving them a good, stable, you know, loving home and stuff, because I was so incredibly, you know, busy with, with other things. But I can't imagine, you know, having a, a young child, you know, who then we give to someone else at that age. And, you know, in some ways, I, can, I guess I can get into the emotion of that a little better now, because for those of you who know our housing arrangement here a few years ago, we sold our our home at the height of the craze and cashed in on it, so to speak, as well as we could, invested the money, moved into a basement apartment with my son, which allowed me to step down from regular full-time work and to uh, get out of an office environment and so on. And um, so now we live in a basement apartment with my son and his wife and three little ones up there. Well, I must admit, all three are very precious, but Karen has been... Uh, homeschooling the oldest, Elizabeth. Her Chinese nickname is Niu Niu, which means what? Little girl. Little girl. And she is our tiny girl, and she comes down with energy, you know, all, every morning, every day's fresh, every day's new. She's a good little student, and she loves to go for a walk with us. We try to get a walk in every morning, and she's good. She'll go out and she'll keep up with us for two, three miles, and she's just got all kinds of energy. And it's very easy for me to think, like yesterday, we thought, well, let's take advantage of this beautiful weather and go for a walk in Conesty Nature Preserve. If you've never done that, you should do that. And, um, and so, you know, I know there was a car seat in the car, so I said, you know, there's a car seat in the car. Should we take her along? So we actually took her along, along with Joey, our youngest, who's now, I don't know, 28, 29. But, 
is amazing. So like I said, I can identify with this whole idea of leaving a child a little bit more emotionally now because I have this grandparent role where I can enjoy the children and then send them back upstairs. <laughs> and, and you know, not deal with, you know, some of the, the harder parts of the, of the child rearing from time to time. But this is really pretty amazing when we think about this setting. We need to remember that as we look at this song. So this song records the worship that she offered on the very day she left her little boy, who at this time was her only child, at the tabernacle, never for him to live in her home again. Now let me ask you, do you think Eli was aware of this prayer? I think it's very likely. Yeah. Yeah. It was recorded. They had regular contact with him every time they would come and visit Jerusalem for the, or not Jerusalem, but Shiloh at this time, for the for the various feasts. She would bring <coughs> little Samuel of Code every year. So they had continual contact with him, and somehow it was recorded. And I think he would have been uh, very aware of this too. And that's important because there's some truths in there that I'm sure that that he was aware of and that would certainly sink down into his heart in regard to some of those themes that we saw. Well, she began with uh, thanksgiving and praise. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. She showed a depth of commitment and love for God that, quite frankly, may humble us. And uh, on that day that she made that biggest sacrifice of her life, she rejoices in the Lord. And she points out that it's the Lord who helped her rejoice. He's the one who made her strong. He gave her strength to leave Samuel at Shiloh. She continues with a warning next, and to the arrogant and proud in verse 3, in which she says, Stop acting, acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance, for the Lord is a God who knows what you have done, he will judge your actions. Now again, Hannah certainly had her rival Peninnah in mind, but these truths apply to all the proud and arrogant people in the world, which is going to include, in this very first section, Eli's sons. And it will include others later in the book, such as Saul. And so, that again, that's a thing. That's something that I'm sure he took note of as he himself heard this prayer. God does know us, and it's a kind of a staggering thought when you think about the fact that He is the one that really is weighing and judging our actions. In verses 4 through 8, Hannah then gives glory to God who humbles the strong and exalts the weak, one of those things that we talked about. The bow of the mighty is now broken, and those who stumble are now strong. Those who were well fed are now starving, and those who were starving are now full. The childless woman now has seven children, and the woman with many children wastes away. The Lord gives both death and life. He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. The Lord makes some poor and others rich. He brings some down and lifts others up. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor. So again, that's a very clear uh, development of that idea that it's God who humbles the strong and exalts the weak. And we should make sure that we are humble before God because He knows how to humble the strong. If we are strong or exalted now, we should keep humble because the Lord can change our place quickly. And we should be humble before God because He knows how to exalt the weak. We are weak, or if we are in a weak or in a low place now, we should wait humbly before God and let him lift us up in due time. Now, there's one thing we should remember in regard to promises like this. We're not dealing only with a timeline in this life. Some of these types of promises, we may look at and say, that was never fulfilled. I was in a state of humility. I was faithful to the Lord, but I was never exalted. I was never lifted up in any way that I could see, etc. But again... We need to remember that God does weigh our actions. He knows our heart. And whether we receive any recognition or honor or lifting up of any significant way in this life or not, it's not the end of it because we do have 
time in the future and eternity with him. And the Bible talks about, especially in regard to his millennial kingdom, that there will be those who will rule and reign with him. And some of these responsibilities are given as a result of our faithfulness here on earth. And we should always keep that in mind, because sometimes it's easy to feel bad for ourselves and feel like we've been overlooked somehow by the Lord. But he, he never overlooks us. There will always be that appropriate reward. In this next section, Hannah reveals that her confidence in the future basically is confidence in the Lord. She says, for all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones, but the wicked will disappear in darkness. No one will succeed by strength alone. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges, them, ju the Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives power to his king. He increases the strength of his anointed one. So in these verses, we see that Hannah was confident in God's ability to humble the strong and exalt the weak because God is in control. If God were not in control, then perhaps the strong could do what they wanted and God couldn't stop them. But Hannah knew that the foundation of the earth itself belonged to the Lord. God also uses his power to set things right. The wicked will disappear in darkness. That's a sobering thought. Um, he, will, he will indeed... Um, glorify himself in regard to how he deals with, with those such as the wicked mentioned here. Then this last phrase, he gives power to the king, uh, is interesting. Because at this time, Israel did not have a king, and it hasn't been revealed to us yet uh, that they wanted one yet. That comes a little bit later. So when Hannah spoke of his king, she looked ahead to the Messiah, who will finally set all things right. He is the anointed one. So when you see this phrase here in which she says he gives power to his king, he increases the strength of his anointed one, this is a reference. In fact, it is the first reference to Jesus as the Messiah, a Hebrew term which literally means the anointed one. Now that would be repeated by David, by Nathan, by Isaiah, by Daniel, by other prophets, and on into the, the New Testament. The Greek form of that would be the Christ. And so that's really important. Now, just to touch on that just a little bit, we know this is a reference to Jesus in part because Zacharias, the father of John the baptizer, quoted Hannah in Luke 1.69 when he prophetically called Jesus a horn of salvation. He was quoting from 1 Samuel 2.10, and that's referring to the last part of verse 10, translated here in the NLT as the strength of his anointed one. But notice the ESV's rendering there. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So, and so that is very significant. Again, Zacharias was prophesying under the control of the Holy Spirit when he made that mention. And then Mary, the mother of Jesus, also quoted Hannah's song in a number of ways. And we kind of had looked at that comparison before, too, as well. So this is really a beautiful, beautiful um, song, prayer, uh, actually, of praise with real significant content in it. And again, it serves that purpose of foreshadowing in this book. Well, verse 11 kind of, again, points out again that they did it. They return to their home without Samuel, and they have this basic statement that he served the Lord by assisting Eli the priest. There's no, that's not a mistake in the way, you know, it's said. You know, he's a, he's a little boy, but young as he was, he had a ministry there to the Lord. And there are ways that even children can serve God and minister to him. And again, the Lord doesn't overlook that at all. I mean, probably some of his his little jobs initially were, you know, cleaning things up or preparing things or getting garments ready for the priest or, you know, just, you know, things that, that needed to be done. Tending to the door, you know, tending to the lights, whatever, whatever had to, uh, whatever way that was appropriate for him. Now, one thing we're going to see here in these, these next number of verses, at least till the end of chapter 2, but we'll see it probably some other places, you'll see this contrast. We're going to see this look at Samuel. 
And then we're going to see a look at Phineas and Hophni, Eli's sons. And then we're going to see a glimpse of Samuel again. So we're going to see this back and forth action. It's going to be a very significant contrast between someone who is indeed sensitive to the Lord's working in his life and those who have rejected the truth. So contrast this, for instance, this statement right here about the boys serve the Lord by assisting Eli the priest with this next verse, 12. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord. That's an interesting translation. Um, and, and I think in some ways it doesn't carry quite the weight of it just because of the way we have a tendency to use scoundrels. I mean, we may say something like, John is a scoundrel, you know, or, you know, in a somewhat humorous way, you know. Um, this is not a humorous situation at all. The ESV translates, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And the KJV, perhaps the most sobering at all in the way it's translated, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now all of these, I think, are, are accurately reflecting uh, the Hebrew that was written here. Uh, it's definitely pointing out that the sons of Eli were corrupt. But literally, they were called the sons of Belial. Now, Belial was a pagan god, and a phrase, sons of Belial, does refer to worthless and wicked men. But this, this phrase might remind you of Jesus in John chapter 8, when he told the Pharisees who were opposing him that they were of their father the devil. Sons of the devil. Okay? It's a similar statement in regard to his strength and its seriousness. Now that is a significant problem because the sons of Eli were in line to succeed him as high priest and they already were functioning in a priesthood. They were in the line of Aaron. And this is really very important. And we're going to see the ramifications of the fact that they did not, um, that they were scoundrels, worthless men, sons of Belial, that they were corrupt, and especially that they did not know the Lord. Now, I want to stop on this point just for a couple minutes in regard to they did not know the Lord. When I was doing some study on this, I uh, some occasionally will go to sermon audio, and I will kind of look around for some messages that may be on a particular passage. I always start out reading it, ask the Lord to guide my thoughts, but I do look and see what he's taught other godly men. The first person that I go to on sermon audio is actually Alan Cairns. How many of you have heard of Alan Cairns, Pastor Alan Cairns? Pastor for 25 years, Faith Free Presbyterian in Greenville from Ireland, had served in a number of other churches. V very gifted preacher. And um, when he came to this passage, he just sat on verse 12. <laughs> now, he had other, other passages, I mean, other messages that dealt with the rest of it, but he really emphasized this whole statement, they did not know the Lord. Now, this is a somewhat of a sensitive thing. Represented just here in this group are a number of children that have heard the gospel who don't know the Lord. Okay, I'm, I know that. I've talked with you individually. My heart goes absolutely out to you. Um, and I have had situations where, you know, students that I taught, you know, rejected, you know, what they were taught. I was very close to some of them. In fact, I mean, I, you know, Karen, you know, active on Facebook, not, not wasting her time on it, but I look over her shoulder once in a while. And, um, but a lot of times I don't. Because there will be people who will pop up there and the things they say they're doing, the ideas they're presenting, it's like, it grieves my heart. Even to see that. But in regard to, you know, your children, when this happens to your children, I mean, that's a really serious thing. It was interesting because Pastor Cairns titled his message, dealing with verse 12, and I would definitely recommend that, you know, if you want to look into a little bit more, look it up. It's the title of the sermon is A Christian Parent's Nightmare. Is that overstating it? No, it's not overstating it. You know, it's, 
it's just one of those things you're going to see that here because we haven't really read the sections dealing with Eli. If we'd gone ahead and read some of these things dealing with Eli, you would understand a little bit more about what I'm talking about here. But there's a very real sense in which verse 12 is the most sobering verse of this section. He called it a statement of such nature that I suppose that there is not another in all Scripture more calculated to wrap the icy fingers of fear around the heart of a Christian parent. Wow. You see, also, I mean, this. think about this. In his situation, he was a high priest. He was the chosen judge of Israel that gave him both civil and religious responsibilities. He served in Israel for 40 years. He was a man presented here that we see does have personal integrity, uprightness, and godliness. He himself lived in personal communion with God. To any and ability. And yet he was living out this, what Karen's called, the ultimate nightmare of every godly parent. He lived to see his sons grow up without faith in the Lord. He lived to see them, as we shall see in this passage, to defy the office of the priesthood. And, even more so, to spread throughout Israel, by their example, the twin plagues of apostasy and immorality. When Eli heard the news of his son's death on the battle, battlefield, which he will, you kind of think ahead, those of you who have some familiarity or have read it recently, that was in keeping with the prophecy from a man of God who came to him. And in his situation, when he heard of their death, he knew beyond all doubt that his sons had died under the judgment of God. You know, many times when we're dealing with a loved one, whether it's a child or a parent or, you know, someone we know. I mean, we, we hold out all hope as long as they're alive. And, and we sometimes console ourselves by thinking, well, maybe they turn to the Lord even at the last minute, and people sometimes do. Um, but you know what? Eli didn't have any of that to console himself because he knew it was a judgment upon his sons. He had absolutely not one single ray of hope of, of light or hope to relieve the gloom when he knew that his sons had died. He knew his sons knew not the Lord. You know, I, I think for every Christian parent, this, this verse here, it just, it's got to be a compelling statement. It's got to grab our attention. It's got to command our interest. And we've got to remember also, I mean, you know, the humanity of this. Hophni and Phinehas were once little children who undoubtedly gave joy to their parents. Maybe Eli liked taking them on a walk, like I like taking little Nuno on a walk. They were part of a biblically orthodox family. As far as we know, he spoke the truth, and he demonstrated you know, biblical values in his own life. There were areas in which he, he did not parent well, and we will get to that. But um, he, he was at least a person of sincere faith. And you know, if you probably said to, to Eli when his boys were young that one day they would break his heart, destroy his testimony, become a curse to the entire nation, he would very likely not have been able to fathom it. It's just, it's just very sobering. But that's precisely what happened here. And uh, it's... Um, it's, it's just a, a very, you know, it's a very serious thought. I mean, you've got these guys who are priests in the line of Aaron. They disgrace their office. They defile themselves with gross immorality, as we will see mentioned. They despise the work and the worship of the house of God, even making a mockery of the blood of the altar. And we're going to see later on when they went in the battle, they took the ark in there which showed a complete misunderstanding of the, of the ark. And they didn't understand the, what, it repre- what it represented. So this is, this is a very serious verse. I'd like to come back to this a little bit next week, if, if time allows, and give a little more perspective on it. It just happens to be a topic that, that we've talked about in various places, whether it's prayer meeting or other conversations with some of you. And I'd like to go into this a little bit more 
Um, I've just been something I've been mulling over this idea about children of believers who do not come to the Lord. And I wanted to try to add a, some thought, some perspective. It's nothing, I can't quite, I don't, I don't have all the answers in regard to this or why it happens or how to avoid it. Somehow or another, our responsibility exists along with God's sovereignty in regard to salvation. And it's, un, it is hard to understand how those interact, okay? But we do have responsibility in this area, and some of those are going to be brought out here. But I'm going to mention this, including some, some examples from Scripture that you may not have remembered that would be quite sobering along this line. So at this point, we'll just leave it there as being a, a very serious statement. Let's go on to uh, 13 to 17. 13 to 17 basically goes into the first offense of these sons of Eli. And that is they're stealing, you know, what was, what was offered to God. They were disrespecting the sacrifice. Um, verse 13 in the NLT translation, which I'm using here, is continuing from verse 12, which said, Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. It goes on to say, Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork. While the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever it brought up be given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. The man offering the sacrifice might reply, Take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now, or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. Again, that's a very sobering situation here. People would come to the tabernacle having paid for the appropriate animal or type of gift, in this case we're talking about an animal sacrifice, and it was, had significant meaning for them. It had to do with their relationship with God, with their worship, with forgiveness. I mean, it had you know, strong pictures, and for those who had been taught and who had accepted these truths, it... Um, it was something that they hopefully were, were doing you know, with great sincerity. And so when these sacrifices were brought to the tabernacle, which is where we are at this point, a portion was given to God, and a portion was given to the priest, and a portion was kept by the one who brought the offering in regard to the sacrifices talked about here. According to other passages in the Old Testament, the priest received a portion of the breast and the soldier. That's what he was supposed to get. That helped to support them and their families. But now, and we're about 400 years after the law of Moses came, and after these was spelled out and Exodus and so on, and, and you know, <laughs> given by God to Moses to give to the people, and um, but 400 years later, we see that this custom had changed, and they didn't take that prescribed portion of the breast and soul, shoulder but they took whatever that fork, that three-pronged flesh hook fork, brought up out of the pot. So even that was, was inappropriate. But even more inappropriate, you might say, is that they were not respecting God's portion. God's portion was to be given first. And so they were not to take the priest's portion before God had his portion. Now, God's portion was the part that involved the fat. The fat was thought to be the most luxurious, best part of the animal, so they gave it to God. It needed to be separated, it needed to be burned up, whatever you know that would entail. And the idea was that God should always get the best, that he would get his portion first. But the sons of Eli, in their pride and their disobedience, they took their portion before they burned the fat. That's why some people who were knowledgeable about it, objected. As it mentions in verse 16, where they say the fat must be burned first. But it did not. 
They were going after it even before it was even cooked. I mean, I mean, it was even basically raw. And, um, you know, perhaps that was so they could prepare it in, a, in any way they pleased. Or possibly, this was mentioned by one commentator, and I think it's very possible, uh, because raw meat was easier to sell and they could sell the meat and pocket the money. Because you do see them being enriched somehow. And even Eli is at least indirectly enriched by their practices. And that's kind of mentioned coming up. And so there's, there's something that is absolutely you know, inappropriate that is going on. And their greed was just so bad that, that they wouldn't stop with a threat. I mean, they would use violence if necessary, or the threat of violence, and probably violence itself to get what they wanted if they needed to. And apparently they had these thugs who worked for them who didn't have a problem doing that. And so it was a bad scene. If you just think about that, suppose you were coming to the tabernacle. You had traveled. You had purchased this animal. It cost you. It was a sacrifice that you wanted to give to the Lord. And of course you wouldn't have any problem with the priest taking their, their portion according to the way the law said. But to have your sacrifice interrupted, to have God not get his portion, to have them take it in an inappropriate way, to be threatened with violence. I mean, what's this going to do for the, for the act of worship? It's going to cause people not even want to come. It's going to have this, this, this long, you know, this negative impact that is going to go beyond this, this one individual sacrifice. And so we have that final verse there where it says, the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight. For they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. They weren't just disrespecting those people. They were disrespecting the Lord. That's the ultimate sin there. Well, then, as I mentioned before, we switch back and we have this contrast provided again here. In 18 to 21, notice how it starts. But Samuel. We have in this passage the purity and the service of Samuel provided as a contrast to that evil character and actions of Eli's sons. It says, but Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one she gave to the Lord. And then we have a very interesting thing. His blessing is fulfilled. So apparently they would come and visit with another child in their arms. And the Lord blessed Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. You know what that, when I read that, that reminded me of a particular verse in the, in the New Testament in regard to how the Lord blesses us. Anyone want to, want to read my mind? Guess what I'm thinking of? <laughs> now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God it's an abundant God. Did he? I mean, we might look at it and say, oh, it's fair if she had another, another child. Just, but look, three sons, two daughters. And you remember her situation. One of the reasons why, besides just the society pressure that, that she was, that a woman who was barren in this time would feel great pressure is because your children were your means of support as you got older. And if Alcana died, and Peninna and her children didn't seem to have this close relationship with her, what's she going to do to support herself? Now, I'm not saying this is only just a mundane financial thing, but that added to the pressure. Well, look here. <laughs> she can easily be supported in her old age with these children that God has given to her. And again, I just want to point that out as one of the reasons why there was such pressure in regard to having children. They do not have social security and things like that. So we have this statement about um, Samuel and all the, how the Lord 
you know, continued to, to bless Hannah. And it says, Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Samuel also grew up, you know, around these other guys who were ministering in the temple. But we can be very thankful to see that he was not led astray by their bad examples. And as bad as they were, Samuel was different. You know, we can look at this and say, knowing how the story progressed, that this is, you know, why God raised up Samuel. Because, we can say this, because of the corruption of Eli's sons. God knew how bad Eli's sons were, so guided this whole series of events that resulted in Samuel's service at the temple and his preparation to become a priest and judge and so on. If Eli's sons were not worthy successors, and if their lives were going to be cut short, then God would raise up someone else. We need to be very careful, you know, as believers, as ministers, that we do not hinder the work of God. But we have to understand that ultimately, we cannot do that. Now, there can be damage. There's no doubt about it. But, but God is still going to do His work. We are not stronger than He is. And so every time there are men like Eli's sons, God can raise up someone like Samuel. God's work doesn't stop when one of God's ministers becomes corrupt. Okay? Karen? Well, I was thinking of when uh, Mordecai said to Esther, he said, um, after he said to her, don't think you're going to be safe there in the king's house if all the Jews are destroyed. But he said, um, the Lord will raise up salvation for his people. Right. From somewhere else. Good example in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah, that's excellent. Very good. Well, we have this one little note here about him wearing a, a linen garment, like that of the priest. You know, even as a child, he distinguished himself in his service to the Lord. And they were exceptional enough that he received this, this linen garment, a priestly garment, and was referred to as an ephod. And though he was doing these small tasks, you know, God was very pleased with his service unto him. Um, you know, what man often looks at in the service of God is often not what the Lord looks at. And of course, the Lord can can see his heart. And um, we see the picture here of a mother who never stops loving him, who brings him this gift every year, of this little garment, and how the Lord blesses Hannah. So we end on, a, to, for today, we end on a, a very positive few verses here about how the Lord's working in Samuel's life, recognizing that faithfulness and obedience on the part of his parents. But we also have Kind of lurking there in the background, already starting to be presented to us, this very negative example of Eli's sons, and, and they will be dealt with very severely. Now, I've done the, most of the talking today, but uh, any thoughts that you have before we close? A couple thoughts about um, verse 17, for the men despise the offering of the Lord, it reminds me of Cain and Abel, and how yeah. Cain despised the offering of Abel. And, right. And, it, it was such a mm -hmm. despicable thing to God. Right. And it was that they they despised other people's offering, not just, right. I mean, they didn't want anyone to, to have a pure offering. So there, is, there is a saying that we should remember. We should worship in God's way. <laughs> yeah. Worship done in God's way is what pleases Him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can be have various forms. But it's going to be something that, that respects, <laughs> that is respectful of it, and that is sincere, and that is intended to glorify God, you know, in regard to it, all that. Cain was, he despised Abel's offering to God, and these two despised the offerings of the people to the Lord. Right. And he actually had murderous thoughts and killed his little brother because of it. And this, oh, yeah. The defilement of the offering is so great. You know, um, but then another thing you said that struck my mind is when the people were afraid to bring their offerings because of that, that when there's oppressive, I would say government, because they were the government, they were the law, they brought the examples of the law to the people. This is their government. And when they defiled the law, that it caused people to not bring, to get a skewed look of the law. 
just right. as when, let's just say, heavy taxing or whatever it is that our government may do, people get an attitude of, well, I'm not even going to bring my taxes at all. Right. I'm not going to do anything right because this government's corrupt, which is not the right. You know, right. the balanced response is, what is God saying? What is the law saying for my good? Administering justice accurately and maintaining law and order is extremely important to the stability of a country. Extremely. And so we've got corruption in this situation, which is, in a sense, at the highest levels. Right underneath Eli. And again, he's a judge, as well as a high priest, and civil, as well as these religious responsibilities at this time. And so, yeah, that's going to have a very destabilizing, discouraging influence. Yes. Other thoughts that you may have before we, before we go? Steve? Yes. Uh, I was thinking Eli is the priest, and there are times that we as parents pay more attention to someone else if we're in any kind of ministry or service than we do our own family. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, obviously I don't think we know the ages of his sons at the time, but um, uh, if he paid more attention to Samuel than he did to his sons, you know, there's a rebellious spirit there. And I mean, I think we as, as normal, everyday people who have raised children or been in the lives of children have seen that. You think, why is that child so rebellious? He's got, you know, a great family and, you know, he's got everything else, but he doesn't have that love that maybe one of the others have or, you know, I don't know if I'm explaining myself right. But um, it just seems to me that you know, human nature-wise, we all seem to favor somebody else over, say, someone, and that someone can rebel. And, you know, the other thing is that since Eli probably saw the rebellion of his children when he had Samuel there, and he was, he was actually raising Samuel, he was doing things, maybe he was doing things differently, than he did with his children. That's all possibility. We're going to see scripture even commenting how he had a lack in regard to his fathering in several very important areas. We're going to come back to that, and that's a good final comment because that kind of sets us up for this next week with some of that, because I really do want to get back into this, this whole concept of, of parenting, how it influences our children, where the ultimate responsibility lies, etc. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> and, um, and because I think it's important. I mean, it's, it's not it's not the main message here, but it is an important message. It's a relevant message. I'm going to deal with that in a few minutes because it's one of those things where there is a spectrum here in regard to not chosen, not my responsibility, to covenant relationship, and I just need to believe and pray, and it's going to happen. And if it and then a whole bunch of room in between for people to analyze themselves and, and collect personal failures. I want to add, try to add some perspective to that, and uh, so those questions help set it up. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we do thank you for the examples that you give us. We thank you for little Samuel here and how he sincerely followed you, and we pray that his example at this point of even a young man would be something that would provoke each one of us to more intentionally submit our lives to you. Help us, Lord, to live for you, to serve you with our whole heart. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.